Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. All right, good afternoon, Tom. We're here for another of our series of My Big Toe questions and answers. We receive these questions sometimes by email, sometimes by um, your website contact form, and sometimes from YouTube questions. So my first question for you today is from someone who has recently watched the Science of Consciousness broadcast and it rang many bells for him. Um, he says, I have studied emptiness and tantric practice as a practicing Buddhist and made a lot of progress towards understanding the mind and ultimate reality. I had a strong grounding in the sciences, so also take a logical scientific approach. The issue that I have is that when I do make progress in seeing consciousness and appearances in true light, this puts my system into a state of anxiety with strong feelings of disorientation and even madness. Once I've worked through these feelings, I come out the other side with a deeper understanding, but it's a hard cycle. In the video, you seemed at ease with your revelations, although they were challenging. I am wondering if you have any advice on this. And this is from Glenn. Advice, I would assume, means about the very difficult process he seems to be going through in gaining understanding of consciousness and himself and his part to play and so on. Um, I didn't have any such problems. I didn't have times when learning kind of threw me, kind of kicked the, the you know, the what the the foundation out from under me and I had to regroup. I never had those kinds of experience. So I don't have any practical things to tell you there other than there must be some fear and some, you know, you being ill at ease with yourself for you to have these negative experiences. There must be some uncertainty that what you're doing is the you know is the right thing and not the wrong thing there's there must be some warring going on inside your mind whether or not you should be taking this path or that path or whether the path you you the path you have taken is valid and true or whether it's something that uh, you know you're walking down la la lane and have have uh, <clears throat> you know no idea whether it's valid or true so there must be some of this going on inside your mind or you wouldn't be having these difficulties. Now, what can you do about it? I'd say the thing to do about it would be find the fear. Find the fear. Look at the negative feelings you have, the feelings of doubt or feelings of being unsure or feeling of maybe you're, you're wrong or not doing it right, or that you should do more of this instead of that, but you're not so sure that's a good idea either. You see, if, you, if you're in this argument with yourself and you're not sure which way to go, then it's best perhaps to settle that argument first before going. In other words, before kind of taking that leap, it might be better to, to uh, settle the disagreement at home first. So look at your feelings, your feelings of mistrust, perhaps, of yourself, or of maybe the way, whatever that is defined for you, you might look at uh, the, dis the distrust or dislike within yourself where you are arguing with yourself, you have more than one, one mind on the subject, you know, you have part of you wants to go one way part wants to go the other and each part calling the other part names, you know, that sort of thing. So you need to settle that out. There's fear at the root of that dysfunction. Find the fear and deal with it. That would be the suggestion. And that may take a year or two. But if it does, 
that will pay off in dividends when you do start down the spiritual path you won't have these problems it won't be a hard thing you won't be second guessing what you're doing you'll know what you're doing it won't be about belief it'll be about knowledge as long as your path is primarily about belief then that's not the right path it needs to be about knowledge from your own personal experience and all along the way you need to check that knowledge as i say in my book taste the pudding see how it plays see how it's changing you see what this you know what these attitudes do how does it you know ask other people who know you well you know whether they notice any changes in other words you have to stop and look at evidence as you go to see what the overall effect is from your perspective and from the perspective of the, of others now that doesn't mean that you have to change because others don't see it the way you do it's your experience if it's your experience it's your truth now you can misinterpret your experience we can misinterpret any of the data that we get but that's also part of you coming together as a whole person so find your your true you who are you really inside there and what do you really want to do and make peace with the part of you that disagrees with that that disagreement is over fear so dealing with that fear will settle that problem so that would be the only advice i can't give you practical advice like you know what i did when i ran into those problems because i never ran into those problems i didn't have that kind of a thing i i didn't know a lot of answers i wasn't sure where i was going or how i would get there but i took it just one step at a time learn something form a hypothesis test a hypothesis see how it works where you know are there any issues are there any conflicts if so resolve them and you don't always resolve them with intellect the intellect really isn't a whole lot of help here you have to resolve them with life with application apply your knowledge and see how it plays does it tend to lower entropy does it tend to make yourself and the people around you full of happiness and joy or does it create issues if it creates a creates issues and and makes people sad and unhappy and full of of uh do we say uh anger and upset and negative things then you have to reconsider and see why is that is it because of what you're doing is it because of them so you just plod along one step at a time trying to figure it out as you go no need to kind of crash after every step to me that says there's an underlying problem all right thank you tom our next question comes from truth seeker this is uh from a youtube comment tom what do you think about demons i have an evp recording of a spirit saying it's a demon I challenge anyone to try to debunk it. Is it just a lost soul trying to scare me or is it actually a demon? How would you explain this phenomenon with your MBT? When he says that it's it can't be debunked, that's true in as much as it's a non-physical experience. Okay, it's not it's not a uh this demon is not somebody that lives at his house you know eats dinner with him and his family and goes to school with him it's not something that is a, a physical thing even if it had a physical manifestation long enough to say a sentence so if it's primarily non-physical then we're not going to debunk it with any physical arguments that's silly you know you cannot uh, you cannot uh, verify or deny you know things that are non-physical with things physical and and it this it doesn't work that way you know these are two different areas so it's not about that it's about evidence not about you know true or false or you know truth and debunking and that kind of stuff it's that's 
not even a point. It's about what kind of evidence do you have? What does it take to make a demon? Well, you got a voice somewhere, and I'm not sure what your EV whatever is. Sounds like it's some kind of an electronic recording device would be my guess, but you weren't very specific about that, so I don't really know what, but let's assume that it's some kind of electronic recording device. What you get, what your reality is, okay, this, this demon came through in your recording, is your reality. In your reality, that happened, and it said some sort of sentence that somehow made sense to you. Well, your reality is a data stream. Your reality doesn't exist because there's something outside there that exists. It exists because you get a data stream and you interpret that data stream. Okay. Now, your data stream had this thing that you're calling a demon who uttered a sentence. All that was in your data. That data is given to you by the rendering engine that renders this virtual reality. Now, there's a couple of reasons why it might do that. One, because there may be some entity that's talking to you telepathically, and that telepathic message got put in that data. Okay, so that would be your, your demon, I guess. But that doesn't make it a demon. Any consciousness can send you a message. Even your dog and cat can send you a message. All consciousness is on the net. It's all connected. So it came from somewhere. Let's say there's there, or actually there are only three sources, three possibilities of where it could come from. One is it came from some other individuated unit of consciousness. Okay, now that would be a, a demon or the guy who lives next door or your dog or your cat, you know, it could be any individuated unit of consciousness should be connecting to you telepathically. Now, I doubt that your dog and cat would pose as a demon. I just, you know, a, a little uh, lightness there, but any consciousness, any IUOC could send you a message. That's how data gets in your data stream. One way. The second way is that the larger consciousness system can put data in your data stream. The rendering engine can put whatever data it likes in there. So that is the second possible source. The last and final possible source is that you create it yourself and you put that data in there. Now, there is no way that you can tell the difference between source, you know, one, two, and three, the IUOC, the, uh, you know, uh, the larger conscious system and yourself. They all just look like data in the data stream. They don't come with tags. They don't come with a special look and feel. It's just information. You get it from one of those three sources or multiple sources. You interpret that as your reality. Okay. So your demon either put himself in there with a the telepathic communication, was put in there by the LCS, or you put it in there yourself. Now let's look at all three of those. If the demon put it in there before the telepathic communication, then basically what you heard or saw, or whether it was on an electronic recording device, that data can be put on a recorder, or it can be put out over loudspeakers. All of that is just information. Doesn't matter the mode of the information. Could be pictures, could be metaphors, could be speech, could be uh, you know, just sound in your head. It could be letters that you see blazing in fire, you know, written across your ceiling. I mean, it could be in anything. It's just, it's just put there as information. How you interpret that information is just your own addition to what goes on. So let's say it was a telepathic communication from some that are IOUC, and that's your, that's your demon. And there needs to be a reason for that, why you got that interpretation, what the point was, why you got that information, and why it was sent to you. I'd start looking for that. In fact, whether you got that or not is not even all that relevant, but what does it mean and why did you get that? Well, if you got that from some other IUOC, who knows why? 
I mean, that's, <laughs> you'd have to ask them to know why. Now, if it came from the LCS, I can imagine a reason or two that it would be put there. One, it could be a test of some sort. LCS gives people fear tests all the time. What are you going to make of this? What are you going to do? Is it going to stoke up your fear? And, or are you just going to look at it and say, well, you know, I'm not afraid of that, or that doesn't bother me, or let me, let me deal with this in my next meditation. So how do you deal with it? And that will give the LCS some idea of about where you are as far as your growth. And that will give the LCS about what it needs to do to be helpful to you in growing up more. It gets a sense of where is the student, helps it be more helpful. All right. Or the last one is something that you created. If you created it, then an answer could be that it's a, a creation of your own fear. When we have fears, fears that are not in our intellect, fears that are down at a deeper level that we're not aware of, when we have these fears, we often materialize things that represent those fears in us. Now, when we are in an out-of-body state or a lucid dream, in that realm, that manifestation works very easily, very quickly. When you, whatever you think, you basically tend to manifest. And if you're fearful, you'll manifest all kinds of ugly things that are scary. Demons being probably first on the list. So it could be a manifestation of your own fear because you had some fear in your mind that demons might exist and demons might get you or demons could do something horrible to you. And if you had that fear, then you could indeed manifest a demon even on an electronic device. You see, whether it's on an electronic device or written in fire on your ceiling doesn't matter. That's just data and your interpretation of that data. It doesn't uh, give it any more or less credibility. So you have something on, a, on an electronic device. That's easy for the system to do because there's always noise on any device. There's always thermal noise and signal noise Depends on what the device is, but there's always noise levels on it. And the system can always manipulate that noise to basically do or say anything it wants. Or it can put that message there uh, without any difficulty. And you can do the same thing. You see, not only can the LCS do that, but you are a consciousness and can do that very same thing too. You can use your intent and your fear can make things record on a tape recorder or whatever else your device was. You can even see the, you know, the flames on the ceiling. If, you know, if that's what your consciousness, if that's the way it portrays it, you can see that. Now, all these things are real. Every one of those, all three, okay, it's something from another IUOC, it's the LCS or it's you. Only three possibilities. Every one of them is real. It's information. Nothing's more real than information. So whether you're the source or the LCS or some other IUOC, all three are equally real. They're information. There's a lesson in there for you. And that's how you deal with it. What you do with it. Does it instill fear? Does it inst instill a, a, a desire to know more, to study it, to interact with it, to, uh, uh, you know, connect with it and see what's going on there. You know, what, how do you interact with it? What do you do? You could do any number of dozen things, how you interact with it. And each one will tell you something very important about yourself. So that's the way I would look at it if I were you. Okay. Well, thanks for answering that. Um, fun question. Um, the next question is, um, I've been trying to heal myself for a while, but it seems that my subconscious fears always get in the way and I cannot make any progress. For example, if I imagine a white healing light on the gingerbread cookie man, that's usually your example of how to, to go about a healing. In my mind, the light is always immediately overrun with blackness in one way or another. 
This happens with the other healing tools and with other people that I try to heal as well. I have a heart condition that is a weakness of the sinus node in the heart. It makes my heart beat a little too slow and causes dizziness, tiredness, etc. I'm 23 years old and sometimes feel like I'm 80. Is it possible to heal such things? Do you have any advice on this? And on a positive note, I was able to get rid of the mind altering substances I had, thanks to your videos on ego and fear, and use some of the money that I used to spend on them to increase the My Big Toe Patreon pledge. That's awfully sweet. Thanks for the work you do. I really um, helped me get out of a tight, tight spot in my life. And this is from uh, Solius. Okay. Well, thank you for the Patreon donation. That's, that is uh, very much appreciated. Very, very much appreciated. Um, if you, when you try to heal and you put on the light and then right behind the light comes darkness. And if that happens, not only when you heal yourself, but when you try to heal others, that means that there is a fear lurking there. And the fear may be as simple as a fear that I can't do this or fear that I'm not able to do this or I'm not worthy to do this. That kind of a fear would kind of inhibit you from doing it because there's a part of you who says, okay, I'm going to try this. And there's another part of you who is saying, no, don't be ridiculous. You can't do that. See, that's the part that doesn't like itself. So if there's a part of you that doesn't really like you, then that's the problem. And that is also probably the root of many problems that you've had in your life would be the fact that there's parts of you that don't like you that you have some negative attitudes towards yourself, not being good enough, not being, uh, I don't know, whatever you think you should be, you part of you feels like you're not it. You're not as good as, and, and uh, as capable as you would like to be. So those feelings of negativity about self can come out in all sorts of ways. And they would definitely get in the way of your healing yourself or other people. The negativity takes back what the positive attitude gives. So you like a, a you know, the, you know, there's a light version of you and a shadow version of you and they're in constant conflict. So one thing to do would be to, to work on that fear. Try to deal with those fears because almost certainly what you will find is that it's not true that you're inadequate or not good enough or unworthy. That's not the case. The case is that you just believe that about yourself. And that belief came from experiences that you had when you were probably much younger, you know, two, three, four, five, six, you know, eight, 10 years old. We often, because of the way we're treated, because of things that happen, because of circumstances, we come to those kinds of beliefs. And then we carry them with us the rest of our life and struggle with them. So if you, if you meet that, you know, if you get to that fear and you face it, you will find it will disappear like smoke in the wind. It'll just evaporate and become nothing because there's nothing really there other than your own belief that it's there. So that's one practical thing you can do is try to work on getting over that fear. You need to do things that that increase your self esteem and that increase your self confidence. So whatever those things are, you should try to find those things, things that you do well, friends that you do enjoy being with and who enjoy being with you, things that will help you uh, find positiveness. So you always be positive. So if there's anything in your life that's feeding you negativity, <clears throat> it'd be a good idea to let that go. And if that happens to be an individual or a family or a roommate or whatever, then it would be a good idea to let that go. You know, let that go as much as you can. So look at the things in your life that are 
that people are sending you negative messages and <clears throat> see if one, you're not misinterpreting that message and it's really not so negative at all. You just think it's negative. You interpret it as being negative. And then you can change your interpretation. If it really is negative, then leave those situations. You don't need negativity in your life. You need as much positive encouragement as you can find. So change friends. You can't change families, but you can see the, the ones that give you positive stuff more often and the ones that give you negative stuff less often. You can arrange that. Now, another piece of practical advice would be take your, your need for healing to a healing circle like the one that Donna, Donna runs. So get in touch with Donna here who's doing the interview and she will add your name to a list and you will have a, a whole selection of healers who will work on you. And when they do, you will feel better. You'll feel good. You'll, your self-esteem will grow a little bit and you'll feel more confident. But then you need to hold on to that and not let it go. Don't chase positive with a negative. Oh, I'm feeling much better. Oh, that means I'm going to feel bad again before long. You see, if you always look at the dark side, if you always have a, a negative attitude about, well, okay, this is nice, but it won't last, then you're self-defeating. You have to get rid of that negative part and say, ah, oh, this feels good. I'm going to hang on to it. I'm going to feel good like this all day long. And when I start feeling otherwise, I'll just remember how it felt when it felt good and I'll go back to it. And then when you go to sleep, you say, when I wake up, I'm going to be feeling this good when I wake up in the morning. That's what I mean by hang on to it. It takes effort and it takes energy to hang on to that positiveness. But do that and you'll find your life will change. All for the better. Thank you, Tom. Our next question comes from Kurt J, who has a YouTube channel called Theories of Everything, which I will include in the description below. And by the way, for the previous, let me answer this, by the previous, for the previous person, um, the MBT outpouring will also have a link. And that is the page where you can request that healers send you healing intentions. Mm -hmm. All right. So from Kurt J, who has the Theories of Everything channel mm -hmm. on YouTube, he's interviewed you uh, rather recently. He's received a lot of questions um, from the interview. And the largest question asked, or the most prolific question asked, is besides the upcoming quantum mechanics experiment mm -hmm. that you've designed and that are being conduct conducted by Farvod Pashnud, what serves as proof and tangible evidence for your theory? Okay, well, that's a good question. And the answer is your own experience. Okay? Your own experience. And it can't be anything else other than your own experience. If it's not your experience, it's not your truth. If it's somebody else's experience, then you can either believe it or you can disbelieve it. Or you can set it aside and say, well, I just don't know. And that's it. But if it's your experience, particularly if it's a repeated experience, one that you can, that you can verify over and over again, then that becomes your truth. So that's the only way to verify the things that I say, my, my uh, model of reality and my understanding uh, of, you know, how reality works, why you're here, you know, what's the point to life, all those things, um, you know, what's your purpose, how should you go about that purpose, all these things are uh, specified in my theory. Now, my theory is one that not only describes the objective world, like a lot of big toes try to describe only the objective world, but mine also describes the subjective world. Okay, so 
There's objective science and there's subjective science. Yes, the subjective can be scientific as well. I mean, we have lots of subjective science like psychology and sociology and anthropology and a lot of that. It's still science. People still do experiments. People still, uh, you know, take data and have do statistical analysis of the of the significance of that data and so on. But in any case, the my big toe theory not only will explain to you everything that is physical, like the things that most theories don't explain, they'll explain to you why C is a constant. They'll explain to you exactly how quantum mechanics works. Matter of fact, in a couple of weeks, I'm going to put out a new video that's going to give the Schrodinger's cat, uh, uh, you know, how that's solved, you know, with my theory, you know, what's going on. Of course, standard physics will say, well, the cat is both dead and alive at the same time. It's a superposition of dead and alive. And until the measurement's made, that will collapse that superposition into a single value, and you'll find out whether it's dead or alive. Well, that's nonsense. The cat is not both dead and alive at the same time. The cat is not a superposition of anything. That's not the way it works. That's an interpretation of the probabilistic mathematics. And they're interpreting it in terms of a objective materialist world. And that just isn't correct. So that's why it comes out to be kind of silly. Oh, the cat's both dead and alive at the same time. It's a superposition of a dead cat and a live cat. Well, what does that mean? You know, explain to me the superposition of a dead cat and an alive cat. You see, it doesn't really mean anything. It means that really there is no cat. There's just information. That's what it means. So as long as there's just information, then I can show you exactly how the system decides whether the cat is dead or alive at any particular time. You see, the system has to render that cat. In the virtual reality, the reality is rendered. So it has to render that cat dead or alive. And there's a mechanism by which it applies to all things, that the, that the uh, all unknowns work the same way. And I, like I say, a couple of weeks, we'll have that, we'll have that out as well. Uh, the system, and I, I've talked about it. it's not a big mystery. I've talked about it in many of my talks. You know, you, the system takes a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. That's how it decides what the unknown is going to become unknown when, when it's measured. Okay, so that's how it decides whether the cat is going to be dead or alive when it measures. So there is no cat. The cat is not both dead and alive. The cat is just information. The information will be put in your data stream of an alive cat or a dead cat, depending on a random draw from a probability distribution of the possibilities. So anyway, but that also describes in physics things that generally are not known. You know, there's, there's lots of things in physics that are mysterious, that are, what do we call them, paradoxes, lots of things. Not only is there dark energy and dark matter and things like that, that uh, are suspicious, you know, what does that mean? How does it get that way? You know, why is, why is it doesn't interact, but only does this one thing, you know, well, it explains that sort of thing. It explains where time comes from. Where does time come from? Where does space come from? Where does charge come from? I mean, what are the sources of these things? Physicists know that, well, there is space and there's time and there's charge and there's spin. And there's a whole, you know, there's a list of these things. There's mass, there's gravity, but they don't tell you where they come from. They make models like Einstein's model where gravity is uh, what mathematically described as bends in space time warps in space time, or you can use Newton's old GMM over R square, you know, uh, of gravity. But this is just mathematics that compute answers. Okay, you can compute an answer, you can, you can um, tell what an answer is going to be with mathematics. But the mathematics don't cause that answer. 
You see, I can, I can, I can uh, tell you when the bus is going to arrive at the bus stop because I have a schedule. But just because I can tell you when it's going to arrive doesn't mean that I cause the bus to be there at that time. See, there's a difference. Well, mathematics computes when the bus will arrive. It computes the answer, okay? But it doesn't cause it. The mathematics isn't the cause of the answer, and we tend to get that confused in physics. So it'll tell you all sorts of things. It'll give, it'll tell you, it'll give you a good solid answer for all of the paradoxes in physics. Many of them, a Zeno effect, you know, why when you keep measuring an atom uh, uh, more often than what it's mean, you know, what its average uh, time to decay is, it never decays. It just sits there, always in the same state. See, that's a, another paradox. And all of these then can be answered very easily and straightforwardly with this theory. So it doesn't just do these quantum experiments. It actually overhauls physics, answering all of its unanswered questions of things that, why does it work that way? Why is quantum physics the only, sci the only science, the only part of physics that's weird and non-rational and not logical? Well, it is rational and logical. It's not weird at all. It's just as logical as any other part of physics. You just have to understand what it is and how it works. So for the science, it doesn't just, it's not just these experiments we're doing, but it explains all the unknowns. And it doesn't add any unknowns. It just solves the ones that are there. Now, over on the other side, in the subjective side, any experience that you have that I would call fundamental or major or significant in your life, it can explain that experience, just like it explains where time comes from. It can explain that experience. So if you have Again, maybe fundamental is not the right word, but, uh, you know, it's not an experience like, uh, you know, the experience of smelling a rose. I mean, it can say what that is, but that's not my point. My point is that if you have some kind of fear, some kind of uh, upset, if you're angry, if anything ever makes you feel negative, if um, your life is full of pain and suffering and you struggle and struggle and struggle and don't seem to get to where you need to be, if, you're, if you find life is not satisfying, you know, all those sorts of things. That's what I mean, like fundamental, big picture things, not whether or not, you know, you have a hangnail on your left hand or not. That's not a point, but it'll explain those things. Not only will it tell you why you feel that way, but what you need to do to not feel that way. And then you need to basically follow the advice if you understand the theory, if you apply that theory to your own life, you will find that it changes you. And if you were unhappy and miserable and struggling, you'll find that you're full of joy and happiness and you're not struggling anymore. So that's, that's the basic, you know, it's not proof. It's just evidence. Science doesn't do proof. Whiskey does proof. Logic does proof. Math does proof. But, you know, science does evidence. So it will give you lots of evidence, your own personal evidence. If you'd like to understand that this reality is virtual and that, it's, that, the, that the computer is consciousness, and you'd like to get around and experience that consciousness from outside of this virtual reality and do things that other people call paranormal, well, they're not paranormal. In my model, they're just normal. There's just artifacts of consciousness. If you learn how to develop your intuitive side so that it is just as reliable and just as accurate as your intellectual side, well, you can do that too. These things will take a little time. If you'd like to experience remote viewing, uh, telepathic communication, your ability to heal, um, all these things, you know, the, uh, the out-of-body phenomena, a very unfortunate name because nothing goes out of your body, has nothing to do with your body. But these are all artifacts of consciousness and anybody can experience these things. Anybody can experience these things, but not just for the wishing. You may have to work at it a little bit. And if you're very left brain, logical process dominated, you'll have to work a little harder because that intellect will keep jumping in the way 
of your intuitive side wanting to analyze it and judge it, and that will just get in the way. There is a time for analyzing and judging, no doubt, but only after you have collected enough data to be able to analyze and judge. So that's where the proof is. The proof is in your own experience. The proof in physics is all those things that physics doesn't understand now that are explained well by this theory. Even chaos theory is explained. Why does it work that way? Why do you have these little islands of calm amongst the uh, you know torrents of of uh, energy and you know this, this chaotic behavior and it'll explain how that works what's the basic fundamental reason behind that well we know that a couple of differential equations will do the math that creates that but we don't really know why that should be a fundamental attribute of reality so it's a big toe Big means it covers the objective and the subjective. So it's an actual theory of everything. And that means that it should be able to explain everything. Now, it won't explain, you know, why you burped after you ate that, you know, that last taco. You know, it's not that level. It only is going to explain things that are fundamental, you know, to the big picture. So when I say everything, you know, don't go wild on that. It's everything <laughs> Fundamental and foundational is what it's going to is what it's going to explain. And the only way to get there is to apply it to your own life. Because you can you could listen to me talk about places I've gone, things I've done, you know, all day long, and it won't mean a thing to you. As far as you know, I'm just making it all up or I'm having a hallucination or both. It doesn't mean anything to you. It's only significant if you do it yourself. And you can. Just give it a few months, even five days. I have, I have these little sessions. I teach people to do these things in five days. And most people do have successes in doing them even within two or three days. So you just work at it a little bit. So if the truth is important enough to you to spend you know, a few weeks or a few months to determine you know, whether something's truth or not, then you won't have any trouble with this theory and verifying that it is the way that I say it is. I've had thousands and thousands of people, you know, have, have, uh, have done this and it's not that hard to do. So you can too. So everything fundamental in your life, the experiences that have been your, your big downers and your big uppers, the things that meant a lot to you, there's reasons why those things meant a lot to you. It's not just random. And it's science. You can understand them. So that's how you find out whether or not this is it. You got to, what I say in my book, you have to taste the pudding, try it, apply it, and it will change your life. And if it doesn't, well, burn the book and forget about it. But there's a very high probability that if you actually conscientiously try it, it will change your life. It definitely will, Tom. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Noem. Um, I've watched multiple videos on ego and superego. I wanted to know your thoughts in situations that are abusive. When there's verbal, mental, and physical abuse and emotional, I know you spoke about accepting someone as they are and unconditional love. How does someone handle a situation like this and deal with the anxiety and the fear? Okay, well, it depends on, you know, that abuse that you talked about. If it's physical abuse, if somebody hauls off and smacks you and... <laughs> It's not just a one thing that happens because they got upset one time, but it happens frequently. You know, they do this again and again. Well, the best way to deal with that is to get out of that situation. That's not a healthy situation. That is not the situation where you turn the other cheek. <laughs> That's the situation where you withdraw and run and try to never put yourself in that situation again. And it would be worth thinking why did I end up in that situation to begin with? 
because often there's reasons why you ended up in that situation to begin with. And if you don't work out those reasons, you'll just likely put yourself back into a situation like that again. So then the advice would be, you know, get away from it. If you're being physically beaten, if your abuse is physical, remove yourself and try to figure out why you got in that position in the first place. How did that happen? What was it that drew you into that situation? And learn that lesson so you don't have to repeat it. Now, if the abuse is, let's say, emotional, okay, well, or even, uh, well, let's just say emotional. Let's start with that because it can be intellectual, can be emotional. Um, if it's emotional, well, it depends on how consistent and how heavy it is. Everybody gets upset sometimes, and a lot of people say things that they wish they really hadn't, hadn't said. So if somebody goes off and gets hysterical on you and calls you names and is verbally abusive, again, that is not such a big thing to deal with and say, well, people are like that sometimes, and you just have to let them be and go on. But if this is something that happens you know, every hour and every day and every day of every year, then there's a problem. There's a real big problem. And now this, the thing is, don't necessarily have to run away, but it's when is enough enough? Do you have enough unconditional love for that person just to let that, that verbiage, that abusive verbiage, just go in one ear and out the other? In other words, you don't process it. You don't accept it. You don't take it on. You don't connect to it. You don't let it make you angry. You don't even let it upset you. You just figure that's the way they are. They'll get it out of their system, and then we'll change the subject and go on and talk about something else. Sometimes that works. It's probably the minority of the cases where that works, but sometimes that can work, where somebody who can be mildly abusive is just tolerated because the abuse is a, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, it's only a, a four or a five. And the good parts about that person are more like a seven or an eight. So the good parts about that person kind of outweigh the bad parts about that person. And you learn to just consider the source and let it go and don't get emotionally connected or attached to it or upset with it or annoyed by it. You just let it go because the good parts make up for the bad parts. So that can work out sometimes. On the other hand, if it's all bad, very few good parts, all of it's bad, and it all continues on and on, then you probably should leave that situation as well. You need to get out of that. There's no sense in getting beaten up over and over again, verbally or physically. It's just not healthy to be in that space. Now, if you get rid of your fear, you get rid of your ego, and you, let's just say if you do that, you don't have fear and you don't have ego. Well, if you don't have the fear and ego, then you are a person of love. And giving to other people is an easy thing to do. But if you can do that, then, then you're not connecting to that abuse. It's not hurting you. It's not making you feel upset. You see, when you connect to it, when your ego gets wrapped around, oh, that's unfair. How rude. How nasty of you to do that. That really upsets me. See, now that's your ego getting connected to the abuse. You're interacting with it. Now that's a dance that will only cause trouble because now you will want to lash back to get even or to tell them to stop. It isn't true or whatever, which will just put more gasoline on that fire and it'll just keep burning brighter and brighter until something explodes. And that isn't good either. So if you have fear and ego and beliefs that are going to clash with somebody else's fear, ego, and beliefs, then if you think the relationship is worth it, you can sit down and try to work that out, talk it out. But if that doesn't work, and most of the time it doesn't work out very well, then you just need to get out of that situation. And again, think, how did I get into that? And why? Did that attract me? Why did I get there? Because otherwise you're very likely to do something similar again. 
Now, if the abuse is intellectual, somebody's always putting you down. Somebody always is calling you stupid or that you don't understand, that sort of thing. Again, if you have ego and fear, those will make you feel bad. They'll make you feel bad about yourself. And if you just stuff it inside, you'll get more and more resentful until one day you'll explode. <laughs> you should not do that. You should get out earlier before you explode. If you don't have that fear and ego, then they'll just roll off of you like you're Teflon coated. You know, those things won't affect your self-esteem. They won't affect your confidence. It's just that person who's saying those things, putting you down. It's their problem. You won't see it as your problem. You'll see it as their problem. And if you love them anyway, then okay, that's their problem. But you like them anyway, because they have good, good things about them. And then it's not a problem. You just let it just washes over you, but never attaches. So you never get upset or it never bothers you. Most people can't do that because they do have fear and they do have ego and they do have beliefs and they get hurt and upset and angry, which just feeds the problem. So again, you try to work it out. If it doesn't work out, you go someplace else. Find a relationship that is positive, not negative. So that's the, that's the idea. Now, don't ever see yourself as a victim. If you see yourself as a victim, that's probably the worst position you can be in. If, you're, if you see yourself as a victim, then you're going to have a very hard time getting out of that situation because victims can't do anything about it. That's what makes them victims. They're stuck. All they can do is suffer. That's the only thing left for a victim. So don't see yourself as a victim. See yourself as a person who's empowered, who can make choices and decisions and can do things. Make a plan. Okay? Execute the plan. There's always another way. And if you do that, you have to have the courage to follow through. If you go right back into the same situation, it's likely just to repeat itself over and over again. So I don't know, maybe that's been helpful to whoever asked it, but it, it just depends on the people and the individuals and how much good there is that goes along with the bad and all that sort of thing. But if it turns out that there isn't much good at all, and it's mostly bad, then you should look at it and say, well, what part of that badness am I contributing to? Am I the one that's making it bad? Or am I not? And if you come to the conclusion that you're not the one making it bad, then go find a better relationship. And if that one goes bad, find another. And if that one goes bad, you're probably wrong. It probably does have something to do with you. It probably is partially your fault that you're creating that dysfunctional situation. And if that's the case, it's because of your fear and your ego and your Tom, beliefs. These times make it very difficult. In fact, it's been it's been discussed and reported that, you know, domestic abuse situations like this are particularly difficult in these times where everyone is, is uh, not social, socially mixed, um, they're socially distancing. Um, it does make it a little bit more difficult to employ the usual methods. So in these kinds of conditions, what is the best possible um, method for, for dealing with these issues? Well, realize that you need to take responsibility for yourself, for your feelings. If you feel upset and hurt, take responsibility. If you feel, in other words, you can't feel hurt and upset if you don't have fear and you don't have ego. So understand that and realize that if you feel hurt and upset, it's because you have fear. And if your fear is incompatible with somebody in your life who also has fear and ego and beliefs, then you need to search for compatibility. I see this time in COVID when people are all having to stay home together. It's good news and bad news. Sometimes people also have a big opportunity now to get to know each other again. 
to spend more time with each other, to share their lives with, the, with, with you know, not only their spouse, but with their children, instead of everybody off doing their own thing in their own way. And the only thing you do together as a family is everybody sits and watches sitcoms on TV without saying a word to each other. You know, that's your socialization with your family is to sit in the same room with them for three hours. Well, that's not much of socialization. Well, now you have to help teach the children and see that they do their lessons. You have to get your job done and you have to interact with your spouse all day long. Well, that can be a really good thing. You can learn a lot. You can grow together more. You can get closer. That doesn't have to be a bad thing. You just have to grow up some to where you accept those changes, you accept people the way they are, and you accept responsibility. Just because somebody says something rude to you doesn't have to make you angry or upset. You choose to be angry or upset, and you usually make that choice because you have your own fear. You have a fear about not being adequate. So when somebody says you did something wrong or didn't do something well, it resonates with that fear, and your response is to get angry because it makes you feel bad about yourself. So realize that all of your negative feelings are your choice. You can't say, so-and-so makes me angry. You make me real upset. You upset me. It's not the you that's the problem. It's yourself. You have to take responsibility for your feelings. You see? Now, if you just said, well, I'm authentic. This is just the way I am. I have this ego. I have this fear. I have these feelings. And I just can't be in the same room with you. Well, then you need to go your separate way. But if you look at it and you can say, well, I'm, I've got some fear and I got ego and that kind of makes me self-centered and I really want things my way and I object and get upset and angry if I don't get it my way. Well, then you need to grow up. You not have to have everything your way. You have to recognize that. See, you recognize your own ego and your own fear and realize that it's very highly likely that you're part of the problem. It's not just blaming somebody else because you're unhappy. You are also part of that problem. That's almost for certain. So it's a great opportunity to grow up. It's a great opportunity to let go of that ego, let other people be who they are, and just accept them that way. If that's possible, if it's not possible, then you probably ought to think about going someplace else. If you can't do that, if you can't grow up that much, you see the amount of, you know, how, how grown up you are, or what's another way to say that, how uh, mature you are is basically measured by how self-centered you are. Children come into this world very self-centered. That's just natural for children. That's the way they're supposed to be. And as they mature, they get less and less self-centered. And that should continue on until by the time they're in their 30s and 40s and 50s, that they're really a whole lot less self-centered. But unfortunately, that's not the case. We all know people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s who are still just as self-centered as they were when they were 12. A lot of people don't mature very long. Many don't mature past the age of about you know, 14 or 15. And they just cover it up. They know how to get by in society. They act instead of be. Oh, they can act kind and they can act nice and they can act with a smile and they can do those things. But Inside, they're roiling, you know, they're, they're, they're boiling and roiling, they're, they're unhappy. And, you know, you can't live and act. You have to be authentic. So it's not about acting nice and acting kind. It's about how you are inside. So I know that's not a pretty thing to say to people, you know. Oh, I'm having trouble. My life is difficult. Doc, what should I do? And the doc looks at you and says, well, you just need to grow up. That's not the kind of thing people want to hear. And it's, it sounds like, oh, you're blaming the victim. Now, if you're a victim, you've already given up and you're lost. You can't, you can't be a... It doesn't mean that there are not victims, that victims don't exist. Victims surely do exist. But if you see yourself as one of them, if that's how you define yourself, then 
You need to change that. You need to take steps to change that. Whether you leave or whether you grow up, it could be either one, depending on who you are and where you are and the relationships you're in. You know, either one of those answers might be true. But anyone who sees themselves as a victim needs to seriously look around and make some big changes because that's the bottom of the barrel. Well, Tom, also for physical abuse, and you know, mental, verbal, emotional abuse is very, very difficult and damaging, but it's possible to work with that perhaps. Physical abuse, uh, one shouldn't have to endure. There are places and there are things that you can do to try to prevent that. Um, that's another, that's a thing that um, shouldn't be yeah. endured. Well, you see, you wouldn't have, you wouldn't be in an abusive situation if you probably didn't have your own fear and ego and beliefs to deal with. But that's not, that's beside the point. Everybody, everybody has fear and ego and beliefs to deal with. You know, it's not like, oh, you shouldn't have any of those. Well, probably you shouldn't, but you do. And you will, because most of us are not perfect yet. So yes, you have fear and ego and beliefs, and that's just the way you are. And that's the way everybody else is. So now you have to learn to live with these everybody else's with their fear, beliefs, and ego. And if you can work that out and somehow come to a good understanding and make that work, well, good. Then you'll have a good relationship. If there's a, a big conflict between your belief, egos, and ego and fear with their beliefs, ego, and fear, then either that can be resolved and worked out, or you need to part company. Now, you shouldn't part company casually unless it's just a casual relationship to begin with. Relationships need work. If you don't work at them, they're generally not going to work out too well. You have to put some energy and time and effort. But most of that shouldn't be put into changing the other person. It should be put into changing yourself. Because if you did not have that fear and that ego, you would not be unhappy. You see, so you put the effort into changing yourself because you can't change somebody else. You can't force other people to change. So, okay, you got fear, belief, and ego, and so, do, so does everybody else in your life. All right, now, you can't change everybody else in your life, so you should work on changing you so that you can enjoy the positive aspects of all those people in your life despite their fear and ego and beliefs. You see? So that's really what we're shooting for. I'm not expecting everyone to be perfect people who can put up with all kinds of grief, you know, because they're saints, you know, that's not likely to happen. But you have to realize that you're the only one you can change. And if it gets to the point that, that you can't change you and you can't change them and you're just incompatible, it's better to separate than it is to constantly be bickering and fighting and clawing and biting and doing all that stuff because that's not good for anybody. Not good for you, not good for them, not good for anybody that's around you. It's toxic to everyone. So you better to just not be there. You better to go someplace else. So since good relationships take work, most of that work means working on yourself, not working to fix somebody else. If you're working to fix somebody else, you're going to stay frustrated and unhappy. It's not going to change. The only way to go from frustrated and happy to joyful and happy is to succeed at working on yourself because you're the only one that you can change. You can't change. You can't force somebody else to change who they are. You see, that's the point. So you between a rock and a hard place, what are you going to do? Well, the only thing that you have the ability to do is change who you are. Everything else will just frustrate you. So it's not that, well, you're the one that has to change. I don't mean that way. It's not a comparison between you and somebody else. It's just that you're the only one you can change. And if you think this relationship has potential, then change what you can, which is yourself. Such that the insults 
it's just don't bother you. You just they just don't hit. They don't make you upset. They don't bother you at all. You can say, well, it's the way they are. They just they just have a lot of uh, you know fear and makes them act like that. But eh, they're really good people down deep, so that's okay. I can I can put up with that. It doesn't bother me any. You see, now you can live with it and still be happy and joyful. It doesn't bother you. So I know people people think about that and they think, no, nah, that's impossible. You know, if somebody says something really rude and they do things that are nasty to you, you're gonna get angry and you're gonna get upset. Well, that's because everybody has this ego and all this fear, and that's the only thing they've ever known. They don't realize that when you do have unconditional love, it's really unconditional. So love people just the way they are, however they are. But that doesn't mean it's healthy to stay in an abusive relationship. That's unhealthy. And it's unhealthy again for everybody. There isn't anybody who wins if you have an abusive relationship. And that's any of those abuses. You're better off alone or better off with somebody else than you are in something where you're constantly fighting and bickering and, and it's, it's negativity all the time. That destroys everybody and everybody that's in your immediate circle. All right, Tom. Thank you very much for that. I hope it was helpful. The next question comes from Dondre. One of my recently new favorite quotes from you is when you said, your most optimum life is the one that happens to you. I personally agree with this quote. However, there are a few obstacles I run into when trying to fully implement it into my life. The system has indeed made a great VR, VR virtual reality, in which the majority of things we face will put us on the right path for evolution. And if we let go of control of things, we'll certainly work for our and betterment. However, in my case, I feel this pressure to change the world for the better and have felt a feeling of being special for a while. These feelings lead me constantly to seek ways to get ahead in life to at least gain the financial freedom and influence that would assist me in accomplishing my goals. Whenever I adopt the philosophy of all is as it should be, I feel at peace and as if accepting all makes perfect sense. That, into, that is until the feelings of wanting to change the world pop up. When I say, if it's meant to happen, it'll happen. For things besides the goal of ultimately making the world a better place, I'm content. However, when the it comes out to, <laughs> however, when it comes out to letting go of whether the goals most important to me come to fruition or not, it really hurts. It hurts to see what I think would be great opportunities seemingly passed by. And it hurts to know that there are situations in which the LCS could help, but doesn't in the way most would expect. I know many of these choices chosen by the LCS are for the overall lowering of entropy, but when you get hit with a stick so often and finally get a taste of the carrot that isn't the reward you wanted, it's hard for me not to feel wrong to some degree. I've been working towards a good goal why I can't be rewarded with a more noticeable progression since I myself am still skeptical to some degree of whether I'm even doing it right. I want to completely surrender but I haven't gained sufficient evidence in order for me to trust the LCS with support of that goal in particular. Sure, I can be happy right now if I just let all of it go, but my beliefs make that hard to do. And the fact that I feel my goals are valuable to the system as a whole make it hard for me to accept the possibility of them being put on the back burner. I want to live in a world where everyone's dreams can come true and coexist simultaneously. Me letting go of my dream share feels wrong, especially since I wasn't the only one who asked for such aspirations. I just accepted and embraced them. I know there is possibly many flaws in this line of thinking, 
but why can't the LCS just toss me a couple more carrots since it would be beneficial to see if I'm truly on the right path? Thanks, Tom. Well, humor is an <laughs> awfully nice way to look at it. <laughs> yes. Okay. Well, okay. when, you know, when you just let things happen, okay, the idea of surrender, and you're just going to let things be the way they are and realize that, you know, when you stop trying to control things, everything works out just the way it is best for your own growth and for other people around you. But that does not mean that you should become just passive. That's not saying that what you should do is just, you know, find a stump and sit on it and watch life go by. You know, it's not like that. You should be active. You should have your dreams and you can work toward them. There's nothing wrong with that unless your dreams take you someplace that's unethical and immoral. Then those wouldn't be good things to do. But as long as where you're going with those dreams is not unethical and immoral, then why not? Of course, you can have your dreams and you can grow up at the same time. Those are not incompatible. When I say that you, you know, that everything that happens, you know, is, is happens for the best. You can say, you know, you get what you need and deserve. You know, all these sayings really are saying the same thing. Um, you know, stop trying to control things and just deal with what comes by. But they don't mean that you should be passive. If you want to help save the world, well, put your shoulder to that wheel and start pushing on it. Okay? If you realize that it's not really helping the world, it's hurting the world, then stop. But don't just sit and do nothing. You have to interact with worlds. You have to embrace reality. You have to get involved. You have to get connected. Life is not for you to just sit down on a stump and watch it go by. You need to be a part of it. You need to interact with people, have relationships, have responsibilities. All these things are important. And as you do these things, you can learn to be more spiritual, to be more relaxed, to be happier, to accept things. And now what we mean when we say, let things go, doesn't mean that you don't care about how anything is. It means you're letting go of your ego. You're letting go of your need to control. I need things to be my way because my way is the best way. My way is the way it should be. And everybody thinks that. Every person on every side of every issue feels like their way is the best way. Okay. So we want you to let go of the ego, let go of the fear, let go of your beliefs, but engage in everything. So you're missing the point there when you think it's a choice between letting go of everything and having an active life engaged. Those two are not incompatible. You should have an active life engaged in relationship and connections and responsibilities. You know, responsibilities at work, responsibilities at home. You have to dig in deeply and embrace it all. That is how you learn. It's through those interactions. It's through meeting those responsibilities is how you grow up. That's how you learn to care about other. You don't learn to care about others sitting on a stump watching life go by. You see, so you're confusing those, those two issues. But make sure that what you do, what you engage, is done not just for you. How much money can I make? How much beer can I drink? You know, how many parties should I, can I go to? You know, if it's all about you, then it's going to leave you feeling empty. It's going to leave you feeling unsatisfied. And eventually it's going to leave you feeling depressed. So it has to be about other. When we care about other, that's where the joy comes from. That's where the meaning and substance comes from. So yeah, you're engaged in all kinds of things. And it matters about other. Who's other? Well, they're your children, they're your spouse, they're your boss, they're your coworkers, they're the next door neighbors. They're basically everybody you interact with are the others. 
And the idea is, well, what can I do for you? Rather than how can I use you for my own best benefit? But what can I do for you? Oh, the elderly couple live next door. I'll shovel the snow off their walk because they're really too old to be doing that kind of heavy work. Old man might have a heart attack, so I'm going to go over and shovel the snow for him. Just because you want to, not because you're trying to act nice, but because you really are nice. You see, if you're just sitting on a stump, you won't have that opportunity to help that old man unless you're engaged with that neighbor. And you talk with him. And you know him. You even know that he has a heart problem sometimes. You know, so engaging is important. Dreams are important because they guide that engagement. But all through that engagement, you have to be letting go of ego, not letting go of engagement, letting go of ego. It's not what you're doing, it's why you're doing it. If why you're doing it is to serve your ego, because I want to, because I need to, if it's just about you, then that's not a good reason. It can be about you, but it needs to be about others too. And some things actually can just be about you. You know, you can, you can have a life and do things that you want to do too, but not at the expense of hurting other people to do that, you see. And what will give you joy is the joy you see in the eyes of those other people that you're able to, to benefit from the things you do. So let's say you, you know, have this ambition and you want to build new gadgets or you want to whatever, you know, whatever it is you want to do. If that's a going concern, it's probably helping people somewhere because if it wasn't helping anybody anywhere, you wouldn't have any customers. <laughs> if you don't have any customers, then you're not going to be doing that very long. So most any job has an endpoint of providing for people's needs in some way. So as long as you are part of the solution and not so much part of the problem, then you should feel good about whatever it is you're doing. So it's not an either or. Uh, I can either be spiritual or I can be materialistic, but I can't be both. No, you can be both. You can have a material world. You don't need money to grow spiritually. You can think, oh, if I just had more money, I could spend more time, you know, meditating. No, that doesn't work that way. Money has very little to do with your access to spirituality. You can access spirituality if you're a billionaire, and you can access it if you're poor. Money isn't the problem. It's relationship, connection, caring. That's what helps you access spirituality, not money. And you can do those things anywhere under almost any conditions. Make connections, care about people. You can do that if you're poor. You can do that if you're rich. It doesn't make any difference. Those are the things that help you not only give to the world and satisfy those dreams, but also grow up at the same time. So they're not incompatible. Do it all. Thank you, Tom. And this wraps up our January series of My Big Toe Q&A. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Donna. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our newly created Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.